Hi everyone, I'm Maple Sharice, CEO of Upland Avenue Productions. I wanna welcome you, you guys back to Vision 2020. Today we are covering anxiety and grief surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have my good friend here, Miss Kosha Hayes, who is the owner of a Safe Place Counseling and Consulting in Houston, Texas. So um, Ms. Kosha, I'll let you take it from here. Give a little background um, to all the listeners about you, please. Okay, so again, um, hello everyone. I just just to reiterate um, on April, my name is Kosha Hayes Flowers. I practice um, here at Safe Place Counseling in Houston, Texas, really in the Cypress area. Um, I'm actually licensed in two states, Louisiana as well as Texas. Um, private practice. My background pretty much stems from adolescent mental health, um, working with kids with behavior issues and any type of major, um, you know, behavior problems in school and at home. Um, I also work with adults who deal with depression, bipolar disorder. So I really do have an array of expertise when it comes to counseling and the actual mental health field. Right, right, right. So while we're, before we dive in specifically to uh, the COVID pandemic and how people can unwind and uh, release any anxious moments, I really want them to have a full understanding of what um, anxiety is, uh, what grief or survivor's grief may be. Can you just give them a little bit of an explanation so that to help them really recognize different types of anxiety that they may be feeling? Um, I think what I've been seeing a lot with the pandemic is an increase in the social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's basically due to a fear of being in places where there's large gatherings or um, too many people. Um, normally, on a smaller scale, it's just, you know, with people, you know, if they have to go to a mall, say, um, a gathering, a graduation where there's a lot of people in small spaces, then they would experience anxiety due to that. Uh -huh. But now the increase is even more so because of course with the pandemic, you know, they don't want to, you know, be subject to any type of uh, virus, you know, protecting themselves. So going into a Walmart um, or a small family dollar, you know, or something like that can bring on a lot of anxiety, you know, not knowing if they're touching something or if someone's breathing on them. So I've seen an influx in that. Um, also an influx into depression because people are stuck at home and they're uh, limited to what they can do, you know. So say, for instance, if you have a person that's used to being out and doing things more socially and now they're pretty much bound to the home, um, it brings on a lot of depression, you know, especially different the changes, you know, not being able to work. A lot of the difference can cause people to kind of be in that low point of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so outside of the depression and the anxiety, you know, we're, we're pretty much seeing, um, I guess, a repeat of three specific things, anxiety, depression, and then we have that grief aspect yeah. that focuses more so on a lot of people are losing individuals due to this pandemic. Mm. So not only are they having to deal with anxiety and depression, they're having to go through the process of grieving people that they love as well. Right. So it's definitely been an increase in all of those. And mostly some people that I do talk to, um, I haven't seen where there has been one out of the three, but more so two out of the three if they have not experienced some type of death. So generalized anxiety, yes, we do still have some of that, just anxiety period. You know, we have people that suffer from heart palpitations, you know, excessive uh, breathing, you know, the sweating of the palms and different things like that. So and ex excessive worry as well uh, is a big thing. Worrying about if things are going to get better, worrying about um, if they're going to be infected with something. So mm -hmm. a lot of that is really, really heavy during this time. Yeah, I can see that. So is, because this is the first time I'm really hearing about uh, survivor's grief. So this is a relatively new term for me. Can you um, explain it to me? Is this really a, a real thing or is it just a new term that people are referring to just grief in general? I think it's really um, just a different type of twist that they're putting on it. Okay. Because you look at it with any person that loses someone, they're a survivor of that person. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. So yeah. they're still going to be um, 
experiencing some type of grief. The difference with that now is that, say, for instance, if they've lost a family member that they weren't able to be close to or be near mm -hmm. due to being isolated to a hospital, that's different, okay? That's bringing on a lot of different other emotions because they weren't in a position to say goodbye or just kind of be with that person during those last moments. But for the most part, it's the same type of grief. Okay, okay, got it. And can you share with our listeners any type of, I don't know if they would be called strategies or um, some type of skill that they could or habit that they can create so that they can recognize it and just at least take some of the edge off? I think this pandemic has caused a lot of people to really sit down and and get in tune with themselves. Okay. Um, we're having to find creative ways to keep ourselves busy and occupied while being in the home, um, which is more so a lot of patients that I see that deal with depression. You know, a lot of times I ask and try to focus on, okay, what are those things that you enjoy doing? Because sometimes we have to retrain our minds to think about the positive and enjoyable things other than mm -hmm. the negative. Right. Um, so finding, it's kind of like finding the light okay. in everything that's going on. Um, so I definitely would encourage that you know uh any type of activities that a person even earlier it's video gaming or doodling or drawing or painting yeah. um people are finding themselves in, in even more so and and determining what things that they really do enjoy and that's important when you're dealing with grief mm -hmm. um it's important when you're dealing with depression because it brings on something fun yeah. it keeps your mind off of what is really worrying you and as well as you can use that as a coping skill for anxiety as well you know so um it's it's causing us to do different things in order to feel better in those ways got it got it and i wanted to just interject a question it's something that ran across my mind as you were speaking but it's something that i have noticed a lot on social media is that um people, whether it's female and male, being quarantined um, in a situation where it may have had either previous um, bouts of abuse, um, whether it's emotional or physical, or if they are just living in fear during the quarantine and during this time, um, is there anything that we can give them um, just to help them cope or manage through this um, if they're not able to get out and get the help they need? I think more so is finding some type of outlet. Um, a support system is important because you have to think about that. Sometimes when people are dealing with things at home, they use outside as an escape to get away right. from that. And then when you look at the fact that, okay, now I have to deal with the emotional abuse or verbal abuse on a different level because I'm here with them all the time. I can't just run away because now I'm putting myself in even more danger due to what's going on. Right. So it's important that that person has a support system, someone they can call, someone that they can reach out to in those moments mm -hmm. that can help them with those coping skills. Because right. sometimes that's what you can go in another room, you can go in the backyard, but that's all of those things are still kind of intertwined, right. you know, so finding out who and just identifying a person that can help you with that, okay. uh, that you can actually talk to. And even more so listening to music, different things like that, that you love engulfing yourself at that. You know how sometimes a lot of people say, oh, okay, I just bury myself in work. You yeah. can bury yourself in something that you love and that you, and in, in, that you enjoy, you know, to keep from um, having the bearing of toxic environments like that. Right, right. Um, and I would also encourage people, you know, if they are in a place to where they can kind of just go outside of the house, get some fresh air, yeah. um, that's also important because staying in the house a lot can bring the anxiety on and make it a little bit worse. Yeah, all of that makes sense. It's some great things to think about, you know, because in the midst of everything, sometimes you don't have a moment to clear your mind and really, Think about what, like you said, to just step out in the backyard and, and collect yourself and get into a better mental space. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the anxiety um, and the role that media plays in it, because I know a lot of times we want to stay on top of what's going on by watching the news or going right. on the social places. But at the same time, I think it's helping to, you know, instill fear in a lot of people. So. 
And I think more so that has a lot to do with where individuals are getting their information. It's so much easier with it this day and age in regards to social media. Um, it serves as a newspaper for some people. That's mm -hmm. the first thing they do when they get up. They have to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's very important in this time, especially with this going on, to get your information from a credible source. Yeah. Um, I have some people that say, hey, I just watch CNN, you know, and that's where I get my information from. Because you find sometimes when you look at social media, sometimes you see all these uh, people saying different things about what's going on. You don't know what's true and what's not true. And that's, that's, you're getting anxiety from that. You know, yes. you're getting overwhelmed with all of the information, you know, um, to where it's bringing on a lot more of that excessive worry, yeah. you know? So it's, you know, I definitely, and I understand too as well, people are home, you know, so social media is the go-to. Yeah. But, you know, even with that, just making sure that the information is coming from a credible source, Mm -hmm. um, as well as limiting, you know, the time that we spend reading certain things, you know, really getting involved with it is going to help us even more so on another level. Because I mean, hey, you can open Facebook or Instagram and see something that someone says about what's going on. And then here without even, I call it fact checking um, or verifying your information. Yeah you're taking that information to someone somewhere else, you know, and it, it, it kind of, it kind of brings me back to the toilet tissue issue. Okay. Uh, I always say it like, okay, what has happened or what has been said to have all these people running the store getting toilet tissue? Right. You know, like, <laughs> and, and it's basically because someone said this, somebody said this, you know, Hey, you better go get you some tissue. You better go do this. So it's a <laughs> chain of, and then you, and you don't know. Cause it's just like, okay, that's just like, if you're, you know, I use, you know, we're, we're Louisiana girls, you know, you're on Bourbon yeah. street and somebody tell you to run, you're just going to run. You're not right. going to ask no questions, <laughs> you know? So it, it's kind of like that. It's like, you're listening to things and you're just following suit. Yeah. That brings on additional anxiety, excessive worry when you're doing certain things for unknown reasons. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So in terms of a family dynamic, what are some things that us as parents can do to help our children um, through this? Though they may not be watching the news, but I'm sure, you know, some are aware of what's going on through social media or our friends or yeah. just their school communicating since they're doing online learning right now. I would say be a support. Okay. Um, be as open as and, and honest with your children as possible in regards to what's going on, what to expect. It's okay to tell your children, hey, I'm afraid too. You know, I may not have all the answers, but we're here together. We're going to figure this out. Right. Um, because, you know, sometimes as parents, we want to be able to put that cape on and say, hey, we're strong. We got this. Right. But everyone as a whole is dealing with this whole pandemic and what's actually happening. So being a support to them, letting them know that, hey, if they're feeling some type of way, you can come to me and you can talk about it. Um, keeping them busy, you know, family games and different things like that. It's this, Now is a great time to really strengthen uh, family values and family time. Mm, yeah. uh, because sometimes when we work and life gets the best of us, we get away from that. And it's caused us to really, you know, look at what's important, you know, as right. it comes to the kids. Because at the end of the day, they may not fully understand why it's happening or what's really going on. We right. just have to support them through the process, just as well as we may need support. Yeah, yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. So in terms of the people out there who have lost someone to COVID, um, I'm sure... As you, as you said before, the grief is the same, but I'm sure there's a, a different type of hurt because the virus is so un, you know, unexpected, it's so new. Um, there was no preparation, like you said. Is there something that, that they can hold and take, take away from this with them? I would say for them, um, I would really encourage therapy. Okay. Um, we are, we as therapists have, um, expanded our means of being able to provide that through telemed okay. um, over the phone online to be of assistance as opposed to a person having to come um, in the office all the time. 
So being able to extend that availability to our clients in regards to, um, you know, how a person is feeling is really, really, really important. Um, And I would say in regards to that grief, you know, a lot of people may, you know, put blame on themselves, put blame on others, um, get mad at the situation, um, which is, is definitely okay to do. You know, I always tell a lot of people, it's okay to be depressed. It's okay to be sad. You know, we as humans, we have these emotions for a reason, Right. you know, um, not saying that you're not going to get angry. You're not going to get sad, but what do we do with that? Um, and for the most part, it's difficult when you have to tell a person, you know, it's going to get better. Yeah. Um, because in those moments, what do you say? You know, do we really know that it is going to get better? You know, so it's really allowing a person to vent and discuss and talk about how they're feeling and being an ear versus saying, well, this is what you should do in this instance, because one thing may not work for the other. Right. Right. And as with any loss, we have to go go through that process. Mm -hmm. Um, Every day it may get a little easier, but it's something that we kind of have to go through it's unfortunate the way it happened you know as as opposed to if someone is in a car accident it's unfortunate it's unfortunate that it happens that way but for the most part you have to have a strong support system um i would definitely encourage talking to someone when it comes to therapy and i would definitely also say if you feel like the depression and the anxiety is just so unbearable um seek a psychiatrist in regards to possible medication Mm -hmm. um i have had a lot of people be more forthcoming and more honest about the anxiety and depression now okay. as before good you know it's it, it's it's okay for them to say i have anxiety because it's it's the norm now it's it, you know so many people are experiencing it so it's not this foreign thing that you don't want to talk about or you don't want to think about so i think even with that just being able to have those people in your corner that's going to lift you up people that are dealing with the same thing that you're dealing with to where they do understand to a certain extent mm-hmm. and also maybe getting into some online grief therapy groups too which may mm-hmm. be helpful for that but for the most part it's going through that grieving process um, and dealing with it one day at a time. And there were two things that you touched on that I really wanted to get clarification um, for all of our listeners out there. The first one um, is making sure that they understand the difference between a counselor or a psychologist or, and then psychiatrist. Right. And the thing about it is you, when you're seeking therapy, you want to make sure that you're seeking that therapy from a licensed individual. Um, you do have life coaches, you do have mental health therapists. Mm -hmm. Uh, those people are not licensed. A licensed therapist, um, can diagnose, Mm. um, the difference between a licensed professional counselor and a psychiatrist is the ability to prescribe medication. Mm. Um, psychiatrists will be able, and that's why some people have both. They have a licensed therapy that they see for therapy Mm -hmm. and they have a um, psychiatrist that they see for medication management only. Um, Um, So if um, a person is seeing a licensed professional counselor and they recommend some type of medication management, then nine times out of 10, they would provide a referral to a psychiatrist so they can have a psyche valve done um, to get prescribed something to kind of keep the edge off and help them with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing is, I know you mentioned that telemed is uh, popular right now, considering we've been quarantined. Do you believe this is something that um, would be here to stay? Because I know some people may um, welcome your presence. They feel confident in Mm -hmm. watching this and they may want to work with you through telemed, but they may have the fear that, well, once this is over, who will I be able to talk to? Got to start over or what? Right. And in each individual therapist um, that's licensed, they have the ability to be able to offer that or to not offer that. Okay. From my standpoint, I think that it's good to offer that because for some reason it's like, yes, people can come into the office, but what about those individuals that have transportation problems? Mm -hmm. Um, What about those people who just can't get to the office, but still desperately need therapy and services? So for me to be able to extend to be able to provide that, I feel is I'm being able to help more people that way. Right. right. Um, it's, it's different, 
because um, a lot of times as therapists, you know, we're able to kind of look at body language and different things like that to just kind of see um, how a person is feeling. I do have some clients that prefer to see me in person and say, hey, I'll just wait till all of this is over with and we'll pick back up. Yeah. But I do have some that have urgent needs, you know, to where they can't go a month or two months without therapy. They have to have it. Right. Um, so being able to offer some type of different way to do that, you know, video is 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 just, it's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I, but I do think that's something that I'm going to continue to offer. Yeah, right, right, right. So the next thing I wanted to discuss with you is really breaking down the stigma that surrounds mental health, especially um, in our community. Um, I know I feel like now more of us are seeking counseling, but I know that there's some who are still struggling with the idea of admitting or accepting that maybe they are having some mental health issues. And I think for the most part, the stigma is something that's been ongoing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And, you know, the theme for this month is that you're alone. And I always try to practice with that and and encourage people to let them know that you're not the only one that's dealing with this type of issue. Um, Let's not, you know, I know a lot of times in my therapy sessions, I try not to say, you know, I'm your therapist. I may say I'm your accountability partner because sometimes just the word of that can make a person feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to, you know, like as opposed to you're somewhere and say, hey, I see a a therapist or, you know, hey, I have an account accountability partner, someone just kind of who helps me do things. Um, So I think those different ways can help an individual feel more comfortable with getting therapy. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people are just I guess how they were brought up and how they were raised in regards to what therapy is Um, or it's just something where someone is telling me what I can and cannot do. And I always try to tell people, you know, as therapists, we're not here to fix you. Um, We're here to help and guide you through these areas that you're struggling with to where you can come out feeling a little different or a little better in certain instances. So it's really providing guidance on a different level. Um, So I always, you know, encourage people like, and people can seek therapy when nothing's wrong, you know, Um, it's totally okay, you know, so it's, it's really just making sure that those people who are wanting to be advocates are saying those same things. Okay. You know, there are other people out there that are like me. Um, A lot of times people are very adamant about diagnosis. Mm. So say, for instance, if it is a person that I see um, on a first session and I diagnose them, sometimes I can't diagnose them after the first session. Right. I just don't have enough information to do that. So after a while, even if I do diagnose that person, you know, I just say, hey, it seems like you may be struggling with some symptoms of this, 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 and this, but not too much focusing on what that diagnosis is because now that person is thinking, man, I'm diagnosed with this. How is this going to affect me for the rest of my life? Right. You know, so that's another reason why they're skeptical of therapy. You know, is this something that's going to be in my file that's going to keep me from having a job or something like that? So it's just a lot of different things um, with that. But we as therapists continue to try to uh, shed light on the good parts of what therapy is to where people are not afraid to reach out. Yeah. And for the ones who may have, of course, contracted the coronavirus, but they have beaten it, I'm sure they are battling their own set of ideas and emotions in their head. Mm -hmm. Um, How can we help them with that fear? Um, I would say coping skills. Coping skills is is most important. Um, Some things work for some people and some don't work. Um, So it's really finding out what's helpful in those moments. Um, a lot of times um, I've seen a couple of people who have beat this and, and have a different outlook on life itself um, in regards to being able to come out of that. And not only with that, you know, being able to share their stories with individuals yeah. that may have lost someone due to COVID um, or someone else that may have experienced it and, and got through it as well. Yeah. So it's still this this whole pandemic has really taken a toll in regards to the mental health specter because it's 
It's an influx now. Right. And even after this is over with, it's going to be an influx because people are having to get back into the mind state to where they're feeling that they're healthy when it comes to their mental health. You know, right. they got to deal with the fact that they've had losses and not just losing family members, but losing jobs. You know, people are really going through a very, very hard time now. So it's important that everybody is a support to everybody. You know, so it's it's important to utilize whatever those coping skills are. Okay. Okay. And just to wrap it up, I have one other question and I really wanted us to see if we could speak on some of the other um, tools that I've heard people use to mm -hmm. help balance some anxiety issues like meditation and yoga, things like that. I don't want to give the impression that those should be, it should be one or the other, like mm -hmm. either do those type of practices or do counseling. Can we speak on how they, it may be possible that they can work together for the greater good of the person? Yeah, I, I definitely think that is um, a good thing to do. And when I say coping skills, those coping skills can be different things, okay. you know, taking deep breaths, taking long walks, um, journaling, you know, uh, drawing, you know, um, as well as you say, yoga, meditation, that is a form of a coping skill to kind of help a person um, get their anxiety to a specific level. And the thing about it is I always tell clients that deal with anxiety. Once you start to identify what the triggers of that anxiety is, and you're able to notice when you're starting to feel that way. Like some people may, their palms may start sweating and itching. They may start breathing really fast. That's how you're going to know you're experiencing some anxiety. So what can we do in those moments to keep it from escalating to where you're having a full-blown panic attack, which is a different thing. So I always try to say, okay, what are those triggers? You know, nine times out of 10, this pandemic, different things like that. You may go in Walmart. I mean, I had someone say, okay, hey, every time I go in Walmart, I have a mask and gloves on. But every time I go in there, my throat gets scratchy. Mm. So it, in the mind, they're thinking yeah. that, and it causes them to just kind of, you know, I got to get out of here, you know? So it, yeah. it really just brings on um, different things to where, what can I do in that moment to calm down? Right. You can always utilize therapy to talk those things out, as well as the coping skills to help you in the moment. And, you know, I always tell people, sometimes people are anti-medication as well. You know, uh -huh. they may not want to utilize medication. That's fine. Yeah. And for the most part, I always encourage, you know, try therapy um, or some additional coping skills first before we even look at that avenue. You okay. know, not just saying immediately, you know, you need to be on this medication, you need to take this, it's going to help. Right. Because right. sometimes people can use natural things to really deal with the anxiety that they're feeling. Okay. okay. But you can do both. Okay. You know, you can, you know, a lot of times I will give some of my clients homework, you know, to where, you know, hey, I need you to go home and write this or do a journal entry, bring it back, we'll discuss it, we'll talk about it to where they're able to still implement those things. Because sometimes, you know, guess what? We know what those coping skills are, but when we're in those moments, we're not thinking about using it. Right, right. You know, we're yeah. not thinking about taking three, four, five breaths. You know, we, we're in that moment, you know, so it's important that we can have that redirection as well. Okay. Yeah. And then going forward, um, I'm sure the adults know that they can, you know, seek the counseling and guidance that they need. How young as a parent um, should they consider or bring, you know, not even consider, but just make the decision to bring their child in um, once everything is open back up um, because they're just not coping well, just being the support system that they need? On a normal scale, I usually don't see any children under the age of five. Okay. Um, Kind of just depends because sometimes we don't want to get something mixed up with what they're supposed to be dealing with due to their age. Right. Um, but I think because this is overall, ex you know, affecting all generations, it will be important to say, hey, five, school grade, you know, okay. any type of school grade children from kindergarten on up uh, would be able to 
benefit from that because they were affected in some type of way. They can't go to school. They're home with their parents all the time, you know, so there's some adjustments and changes that they have to go through as well. And not only that, you know, some people have to take their kids out to the store with them. You know, you have to explain to them why I have to wear a mask, why I have to put gloves on my hand. So that age is still good enough to get them to adjust to the norm as much as possible. So I would say probably about five on up school age. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And for everyone watching out there, all of Kosha's information will be listed below. Um, just in case you had some questions, maybe you can reach out and email her and she can respond with something that could help you or carry you through until everything open up, opens up in your area. Mm -hmm. uh, Kosha, is there anything you want to leave them with um, as closing remarks? Um, the only thing I can say, you know, is, is we all, you know, as people are taking it one day at a time, um, if you feel as if you're strong enough to be a support to someone doing all of this, I would definitely encourage you to do so. If you feel as if you're that person that needs to support, um, identify who that person is or what it is, you know, and let's utilize what we have before us to make sure that we're doing well and we're protecting our mental health, not just only the physical aspect of our bodies as well. Right. All right. Well, that's it, guys. I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, again, if there are some questions that we didn't answer or ask uh, while you were watching uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, again, I'm sure uh, Kosha would be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Until next time, thank you.